and the break is coming. And it could come in any time. And I can tell you, uh, if France and Italy and Germany, and they, when, they, when they do break, those three nations and Spain are all going to get, go together. They're going to go down, they're going to make the change into fascism or socialism at the same time because they're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if here in this country, if we could bring s unity, n not complete unity, don't hope for it because it's impossible. Uh, but if we could bring unity on, on any one subject so we could use that as a, a lever to reach people as a debating point, as something that people could rally around, we could very quickly create a, a, a climate in this country irrespective of the uh, efforts of the establishment to stop it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could be in a position when the break came to take over. Mm -hmm. Scott, do you agree with that? Certainly not. Because we have no form of organized opposition in the United States. Uh, there have been times when we've had opposition, when the Democratic Party has opposed the Republicans or the Republicans have opposed the Democrats. The Democrats and the Republicans today are sixes and sevens. They're, they're Siamese twins. Yes, sure. And the opposition forces are non-existent or so nearly non-existent that they hardly count politically. Mm -hmm. They may count ideologically, but politically there is no considerable following anywhere that I know of mm -hmm. that is definitely against capitalism and definitely for something else, socialism or some other positive form of organization. Other than the small little groupings that, uh, you know, have taken well, very sec various sect forms. But they're, they're, they're not political forces. Mm -hmm. They're ideological forces uh, that stew around in a very small kettle of juice. What, are, what is the difference between a political force and an ideological force, to, in your mind? Well, a political force is one that can import, that can uh, impose policy. And an ideological force is a group of people grouped around an idea. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not be able to enforce policy at all. Mm -hmm. And unless you can enforce policy, you're not a political factor. Mm -hmm. And of course, in order to enforce policy, you have to have a mass backing. You have to have some mass support. Mm -hmm. or you have to have uh, leadership that can, can uh, construct that. Right. Mm -hmm. And your leadership has to have an ideology. Otherwise, it can hardly become a leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, m Mr. Uh, Peanut, uh, Peanut Mr. Man, <laughs> Mr. Peanut Man, has no ideology. Mm. No, none of them. Obviously, his ideology is absent. He's a nice guy. He's a friendly f fellow. He would like to get along with everybody here and everybody in the rest of the world, but he has no way of going about it. Mm -hmm. If he has a way, he's kept it snugly in his pocket until th this evening. Well, Scott, don't, don't you see any possibility of, uh, of uniting the left? No, the, the left. There is no left in this country. Oh, there right, is right, no org oh. There is no political left oh, in this country. I, I organized, that's what I'm talking no, about. But, but see, there is no left. Now, if there were a powerful left in the Republican Party and a powerful left in the Democratic Party and a power powerful scattering left in the rest of the country, well, then you, you might talk. What do you mean uh, left? Well, <coughs> Revolutionary, re revolutionarily conscious. Well, what conscious of the fact that the present system has failed. We're living in a system that was set up in 1789. That's the date when the Constitution was written. That's the 18th century. It's outmoded, it's obsolete, it's, import, it's unimportant and impotent under the new situation. There's, there's nothing else beside uh, what well, they call freedom and democracy, there's nothing else except these 18th and 19th century slogans. And if, if there is anything else, I haven't heard about it and I read the papers well, very consistently. Listen, there's a large segment of our people in this country, and uh, particularly in, in, the, in our schools and so forth, our colleges and so forth, and that are believe that 
as you do, as you just stated, that the capitalist system is moribund and uh, decadent and is uh, uh, falling apart. And There's a lot of people. And that a revolutionary movement alone is politically important. Well, you've got to stimulate. You've, you've got to start a <laughs> revolutionary movement, and you've got to have leadership, and you've got to have a, a movement to move towards. That's right. That's and, right. Um, and none of these things exist in the United States at the moment. Well, I, that's what I want. <laughs> that uh, I'm tremendously impressed by this effort. I, this is the first time I've come into contact with this, your particular effort here, you see. I'm tremendously impressed by the, the potentiality of this effort. Mm -hmm. And I'm very glad I've had a chance to participate oh, in tremendous. it. Me too. Tremendous. Okay, well, let's pursue, <laughs> pursue on because now, now, now we're hotly uh, involved here and I want to ask a couple of well, noted questions. You on? Yes. Okay. What I would like to know is it seems as though where, where you have taken this discussion is to a point, and I think, Carl, this is what you're implicitly getting at, or not implicitly, explicitly stating, where do we begin? Because what you are saying, in essence, uh, Scott, is you are saying that we are at a point where there are no cohering forces existing in this country that are pulling a political and ideological force together as a beginning point. You are implying, Carl, that there are small groupings of people. It would seem to me the next question to ask is how do these groupings pull together? What brings them together? Is it merely an economical breakdown that pulls them together? I've always heard that there, there's something fallacious about arguing that the economy, once it breaks down, you're going to expect people to flock together. They'll be too busy looking for food. So what pulls well, them together? Well, if there's an ide uh, ideological uh, question or, or, or movement, if we could adopt some of the of the uh, sayings of, of uh, Debs, for instance, if you take that one saying, the people should own in common those things they need in common, point out that uh, the false, our country is falling apart. And uh, it's because a few own the means of producing and distributing wealth. If you could, uh, if if the left could get together on that, just that one point, let's let's. Uh, if they don't believe that, they're not leftists anyway. If they don't believe that that uh, we should change our economic system, and there's only one way to ch to change it is to change it from private ownership to, to common ownership. There's no use talking about in-betweens because there isn't any in-between. But if we could uh, organize to take those pamphlets and stick them in, in everybody we see in, on, uh, on our en envelopes, if we could bring the people to, to understand that point or to be acquainted with it anyway, and th we had leadership that when the right time comes, it won't, it can't come as long as the, there isn't a, a breakdown. And a breakdown can come very easily. They're just sitting on there quivering right now. Are you saying then that a breakdown will galvanize these weeds? It, if it, it will galvanize the people in some direction, as Scott said, it will, it will go, probably go fascist because the, the, the uh, leadership uh, the reactionary leadership in uh, trying to restore capitalism or to, to pick up the pieces of capitalism if, if a break comes, mm -hmm. uh, they will be the, the uh, eloquent ones. They will be the ones that are articulate. And, uh, but if, if we had, if the left would organize and unify just to the point of agreeing on that one point, and uh, I think it can be done. I How? think it. Well, <laughs> now that's a naive question. And now we yeah. have the phone ringing. All, uh, see, as soon as you ask that question, all pandemonium breaks loose. <laughs> <laughs> Phones ring, buzzers. <laughs> are, you, are you on now? Why don't, why don't we stop it just a moment? Okay, yeah. oh, because uh, there's no concern yes. that we can uh, point to he forgot. that uh, proves that socialism does work. And um, I'm going to 
to Cuba next, in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, in little Cuba, with all everything against it that could possibly be thrown against it, is prospering, building a, a, a solid society, and um, because of the climatic conditions and the dearth of, uh, of natural resources, they're handicapped. They can't, can't move like a great nation like Russia did. They got to move slowly, same as uh, Czechoslovakia and, and Romania. They, they're not moving too fast, but um, it can be done. And if we don't try it, if we don't uh, try to, to unify uh, the left. And when I speak of the left, I speak of a, a, a large body of our, of our citizens. What about the labor movement? The labor movement... Uh, or should I, now, should I even uh, use that word? No, is it moving at all? No, it, the labor movement <laughs> is, is just as corrupt and probably more corrupt. It's a, George, it's a junior partner of capitalism. Yeah, yeah. George Meany. Now, are you it, speaking in terms of the leadership or the rank and file? The, no, or both. Well, the leadership, of course, follow, but I mean the uh, the membership follow, but people and like unanimity. So I would take issue with that. Unanimity. Uh, are they are you are they uh, the rank and file uh, unanimous? Oh no 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 no. No, they they uh, but they could be changed very easily, mm -hmm. but. Men like Meany and, and uh, the other leaders of, of labor, they've got their, their up to their necks in, in corruption and graft. Mm -hmm. They're not going to change. They're, uh, they're more capitalistic than, than Rockefeller is. Mm -hmm. Don't look at the labor movement. If you're looking at, at, at the uh, uh, leadership and uh, the movement of labor, they're not moving any place. They're going backwards. They're losing membership and everything. But there's a, uh, a falling away by the membership uh, from the unions. They're dis, dis in, in, uh, they mm. see the, the light. But um, From where are these alternative voices, uh, you know, those few voices that you're referring to, Carl, where, where are they located? If they're not in the labor movement. <laughs> He, 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 did you see that? No, he, he's, he's pointing at us. <laughs> what, what about it, Scott? I mean, do you see any, uh, any voices, that, let's say, in the environmental forces? Plenty of voices, but no movement. Yeah. As yet, no movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do, is create a movement. There are spots of disaffection, mm -hmm. definite disaffection. Mm -hmm. But there are only spots. It isn't a movement yet. Well, now, you know, it also, what you're implying, is, like when you say that uh, it, what we would need is another Mao Zedong or uh, somebody of this sort, are you saying then that uh, we, we need great men and women as no. the standard bearers no. of the movement? Or, or do you see that, uh, do you think that's possible in this, uh, this day and age, that one single voice like your Debs would uh, come along and galvanize? Because we live in a cynical age, don't we? I mean, isn't there a lot of cynicism in, uh, in monopoly capital yeah. life? How, how would the one voice unify? They can't, uh, one voice can't, without you've got, a, got it built up to the point where they accept, will accept one voice. Mm -hmm. if one they, voice must focus real discontent and real hope for betterment. Mm -hmm. One voice can focus that, yeah. but the hope for the, the real discontent and the real hope for betterment must be there to be galvanized by the one voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aroused, galvanized, and led by, not by the one voice, but by uh, a leadership which is not tarred with the stick of the old system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, you, you can't count on your fingers the number of leaders of the left who are outstanding human beings and outstandingly recognized as outstanding human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mention them. Well, is it liberalism one of the diffusing forces here? One of the divisive forces, yes. Liberalism means, well, now really take it easy because you don't have to go that far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and what I'm saying is um, that we're living with 
an obsolete economy, form of economy, an obsolete political system, an obsolete culture, a culture of the late, 19, uh, the late 18th and the early 19th century. Now, as long as people continue to watch TV and believe that this is the greatest country on earth, there's nothing that can really effectively move. When people begin to realize what I've just said, that we're the great, rich, backward country of the world, then uh, they'll be prepared to do something. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they'll need leadership, and they'll also need members, a lot of members, who are ready for action. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is what is called a revolutionary situation. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that the term revolution is extremely unpopular with the ruling elements in the United States. It must become popular with the masses of the United States. And as the, as, the, as the lid is held on by those in power, it becomes increasingly inevitable that the lid be blown off. Right. Well, Carl, I throw it back to you. How, how are these uh, movements, how are, how are these well, uh, groupings uh, going to go here? All we can do, all that uh, people can do, Scott is absolutely right, as long as People have plenty to eat, and they have a car, and they have a TV to watch. Uh, they're not going to move, not until their belly button begins to contact their backbone. And uh, until they're affected, until they're laid off, and, 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 the, and their Social Security and the unemployment uh, funds are gone, and, and uh, they begin to realize that uh, they they've got a problem on their hands. People, they're not you're not going to get a one of them away from that. But we can hand them a little leaflet that, uh, that explains a little bit, so that they're familiar with it. That there, there is an alternative in the back of their mind. As we used to do, we used to get up in the morning, Sunday morning and uh, a bundle of appeal to reasons under our arm and leaflet and go around to, uh, we'd lay out the town in, in, in blocks and I'd have one block and I'd, I'd, I'd put this propaganda material in, in every house. We did that. If we were organized at that point, we could, we could uh, change the uh, atmosphere, the, the climate here uh, oh, quite a little, and we could prepare for this time when the break is coming because we're not going to do a thing, we're not going to accomplish the thing until the break does come because uh, th there's no way because they have the power, they have, have the influence. And, but the instant their, their system fails, when, when their monetary system fails and their stock markets go to hell and and uh, the, the factories start to stop producing things. Then if we can organize, we can, uh, in different places, we can uh, where, uh, say a, a, a mill or a factory shut down that the workers can say, well, we're going to take it over and run it. Well, now, didn't, uh, didn't uh, now, Carl, and I'll throw this out to you too, Scott. Didn't uh, Lenin, for example, take issue with a type of economic determinism. Didn't he take issue with a, a type of belly bone to the, uh, or belly button to the backbone theory that uh, all of a sudden there's going to be an inevitable break? You know, wasn't yeah. that the second, second international line that, they're, they're, that the two were going well, to meet contact and all of a sudden there was going to be a falling apart? Where, is that political? Is that a political? Well, it, it can fall apart uh, in different ways. You know, it fell apart in, in China in one manner and, and in uh, Cuba in another manner, in Russia in another manner. And uh, the, the leadership and, and the breakdown was great enough so that they had a vacuum to move into. And uh, if we're going to change, we've got to have a vacuum to move into. Do you agree with that, uh, Scott? There's one thing that you must remember. Until 1917, socialism was a theory. Since 1917, the Soviet Union for the last half century has been building or attempting to build a socialist society. 
And for a long time, no other country was a socialist country. At the present time, there are 17 countries whose constitution, they're all republics, their, their constitution says, we propose to establish a socialist society. And eventually, we hope that this socialist society will evolve into a communist society. And this is already happening to a degree in a big segment of the world. Now, can this force, can these forces continue to develop as they have developed since 1917? Well, or can some, some group, some fascist group, smash them? And the fascist groups tried to smash them in the meantime, and the fascist groups are pretty well uh, quiescent at the present moment. And we're asking ourselves here in the United States, can we find some alternative to a new American revolution? Now, my answer is evidently not. You may answer yes for A, B, and C reasons. My answer is evidently not. What do you feel about that, Carl? Well, um, you see, we're theorizing on how, how changes are going to take place. And of course, that, that's uh, speculative and, and uh, we vary, every country will vary. But there's so many factors that are, that are right standing to doom the capitalist system in, in, in the West, so-called Western world. As I was saying a while ago, if, uh, if France and Italy, now Italy is voting herself into socialism, and, uh, uh, it, it, and they're all just uh, ready to fall apart, and they're being held together with, the, I don't know what, you know, the United States is, is supporting most of it. But if, uh, for instance, if France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, that, that group right there together, and, and when they go, when one goes, they're all going to go now. But what, what, now why? Well, they're going to uh, either vote themselves into uh, to socialism, they're going to vote the, uh, uh, in their parliaments in, in Italy, they already done it. They're in, in, sitting in the dominant seat now. Do you agree with that, Scott? Well, of course, <laughs> I don't follow this line at all. I would say that these four, these four or five countries are still built around uh, monopoly capitalism. Yeah. With fringes of reformist reformism, uh, social security, and the like. Now, <clears throat> your, your hope that some force will bring these five countries together is contradicted by the whole history of the modern epoch. Because in the modern epoch, these countries now, not, not only haven't got, come together, but repeatedly they've lined up on two sides and, and knocked the daylights out of each other. Of course, now, what not, reason have you be to believe that France, Italy, uh, I, I'm Germany... I'm not saying they, they will come together, Scott. I'm say they, they're going to fall. Their, their economies are going to go to pieces, and they're going to fall. And uh, so and far as the United States is concerned, as far as the establishment of capitalism is concerned, uh, the citadel of capitalism is going to remain in the United States. But the supporting uh, elements... Uh, like the countries I name and, and, and uh, uh, England and so forth. But now in Japan, Japan could go into revolution in no time at all. They're a very heavy, big uh, revolutionary force in Japan and, and uh, they've developed in such a manner that they're on the march anyway in their changing. And uh, they're the type of people in the next few years and maybe in the next few months, things are going to happen in Japan. Who is leading what, them? What I, well, who, the, who is leading the, them? The Communist Party is, is, is quite powerful in, in, in Japan. 
as it is in uh, Italy and France and, and uh, Spain and, and so forth. Here, the, we're split up, all the left is split up, so you, as, as uh, Scott said, we're just fragmented to the point where we're nothing as far as, as a revolutionary movement is concerned. Those countries are different. Now, when those countries pull away from the United States, where in the hell are they left? Where are we left? We're an island uh, that uh, the rest of the world will be different. It'll be socialist. They've got to go to socialism. In order to survive, they've all got to go to socialism. But see, got to, got to go applies inevitability. Yeah. And is that uh, consistent with a, a socialist uh, consciousness which sa says that, well, or at least as I understand it, argues that consciousness has to be developed, it has to be nurtured. Mm. Now, yes, Scott, exactly. that, what, how, how uh, I'm, I'm getting confused. As a member of the younger generation, I'm getting confused. How, yeah. how do we oh, nurture okay. consciousness? under these circumstances. Uh, a consciousness of the need for change and, yes. and, uh, and uh, to know... In that, a socialist direction. And to know the, the direction. Well, that's uh, by information. And of course, in this country, we don't have it. Well, no, that's different. In Japan, they do have... Uh, the, 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 the Communist Party holds meetings and they have... they're developed their power. They have a... a in, the, in their diet, diet there, they have several members of the Communist Party. And s same way in, in uh, France and, and Italy and s Spain. And um, they're much nearer the change. And it's only s the support of the United States that, that holding it. You know, uh, the presence of our military forces in, in the Philippines, the only thing that keeps the Philippine Islands from becoming become revolutionary socialist. Uh, I must admit, I'm, I'm becoming this, uh, a little confused here because it seems to me we have several lines of argument going on at the same time. One is an implicit line of a type of economic determinism that occasionally is being argued. One is a line that's saying that we need a more directed type of conscious uh, leadership that would be led by a, a theoretically conscious leader who has backing from a mass force of people, etc. A third is somewhere in between that. Now, how do you see, you, we, for a moment there, we were talking about five different countries possibly cohering together. Well, is well, that possible? Breaking away from the capitalist order, that, that's a better term. They can break away in any manner they want to. Uh, this is very different from getting together. Yeah, breaking away and getting together are two different concepts. I mean, breaking away from the, from the, from the uh, capitalist. That's right. Orbit. That, but that's breaking away. Now you are you use another phrase and that means getting together. Well, uh, they probably will. I, I think that the, the the natural movement would be if they break away, would be to get together for why for support. Why for support. Because they, they would. Uh, why? Why wouldn't the working classes in those uh, societies go fascist? Well, I, I, they could. Be, they could if. But the, in those countries, as I understand it, they're well enough informed about economics that they they wouldn't be because there are uh, organizations, the Communist Party, in all those countries are, are strong. Were Scott, like for example, were the Ger German working classes informed in the 30s? They were the best informed working classes in Europe. Then, then why did they go fascist? Because <laughs> greater power. Well, they were the best informed working classes in Europe. That's, and they went fascist. Now, the best informed working classes at the present time, they also go fascist for the same reasons. Why? In this country. I, I don't have to answer the question why in order to make the, uh, to uh, em emphasize the analogy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I, I refuse. I, I refuse to undertake to say why, because you wouldn't accept it anyway, and because <clears throat> I'm I'm not in a position to say why, and put my finger on exactly the cause. I don't know. I watch the situation with great interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, regardless of our divergent view, do you think that there are any possibility of any unanimity on any point? in this country and the, the left, the, say the different socialist parties, the communist parties? Let's begin by saying in this country there is no political left. There are ideological groups, grouping here and there a few people. There is no political left in the sense that here is the right and there is the center and there is the left. This is the concept. We have no left in the United States in a political sense. Now ideologically we have people with a left, leftward inclinations. Politically, we have no left. And as long as, as we have 97% of our people watching TV, and as long as TV remain, remains under its present control, there will be no left in the United States. Now, I, I don't mean by that that uh, you can ride in on horseback and take over TV, you can't. <laughs> TV is a part of the establishment, and it's a part of the establishment that is maintained in order to prevent the kind of thing that we've been s discussing this afternoon. If the TV people could prevent us mm -hmm. from getting together and saying what we've said this afternoon, they would happily do it because they don't want, ha they don't want this to happen. Are the, are the schisms between an ideological movement and a political movement so, so developed and so wide, are the schisms so wide that a political alternative is not possible in this country? I didn't say that a political alternative is not possible. I said that today we have no political left. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, if we had, I would join it. Well, uh, if, well, you could, if you could name it, I would happily join it. Yeah. I see that we, I say we have no political left. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, Scott, if we said to a, an individual or a group, um, Presenting the, the situation as it is, the breakdown of capitalism, is, is everything that points to, to the chaos that we're developing in this country, and uh, we'd say uh, uh, the social ownership of the means of producing wealth is the key to the whole thing. As long as a few own it, we're going to have the same thing. And those that would say, I would prefer to establish uh, a, a commonwealth, a, a socialist society. That is, to the point of the people ownership of, of the means of producing and distributing wealth. Now, that is the left to me. If a person doesn't believe that, he isn't on the left. He's, he's on, a, on a fence someplace, you know. He may, uh, but if he doesn't believe that, uh, but that the people should change from a capitalist to a socialist state. What he, percentage of the American people believe that we should change from, social, from capitalism to socialism? What percentage of the American people, oh, of I, the American electorate, the voting people in the United States? One percent, would you say, or two percent? Certainly, that's a two uh, percent is uh, an exaggerated statement. Oh no, no, no! You're you're uh, utterly wrong because. You there's think it's more, more than 2 percent? There's more than 10 percent. I don't meet them. There's closer to 20 percent. I don't meet them. And, uh, and particularly that, that belief is uh, held by the people who count, who, who think. The people who watch their TV, TV and don't think, they're not a power on, for, any, for either side. Do you think that 10 percent of the American people would like to see the kind of a revolution that would replace capitalism with socialism in the United States? You think 10 percent of the American people feel that this way? I would say if you could make one half of 1 percent and make it stick, you'd be doing very well. Well, that's cynicism. <laughs> <laughs> if we're that bad, we're <laughs> no, no, we're not finished. We're not finished. <laughs> because there are millions of people in the United States who are dissatisfied with the present situation and who are paying rent and uh, 
buying homes and buying cars and buying TV sets and who are looking this way you know, and wondering, well, well wh what is the answer? There are millions of people in that position. But to say the only answer to the present situation is a social revolution that will eliminate those in power and put in a new group, that th this is one quarter of one percent maybe, or thereabouts, perhaps. I would say perhaps. See, isn't the danger, uh, Carl, the, always the danger of populism? In the, in the sense that well, doesn't populism uh, as a, uh, a type of reform, what, a type of radical reform, tend what, to deflect away from the broader political organization that you're referring to, Scott? What I fear more than anything else, uh, development of societies like the Scandinavian countries of half socialism, so that they have uh, their TV and also their, their uh, social security and, and their uh, minimum wage and, and uh, social medicine and a few of the amenities of, of socialism. And uh, I'm afraid we'll reach a place like that 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 wouldn't in, can't endure. Fascism can't, can't endure any length of time because it's an absolute contradiction of everything. It, even the uh, TV watchers would uh, get up in arms against that. We can, they can, if a crisis comes and uh, the uh, fascists are able to take over, they're able to establish a fascist government here, it couldn't last any length of time because it would engender a continuous revolutionary situation. But uh, I'm afraid of the, of the uh, creeping, what they call creeping socialism, you know, where you have a situation where people are, are more or less satisfied, they have enough to live on and, and uh, uh, they will endure. But that, that condition can't last too long either. Cap capitalism is more secure in Scandinavia today than it is in the United States. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. That uh, that uh, the change to a socialist system is is more endangered in in the Scandinavian countries than it is here because we have a chance to break with it. But in Scandinavia, they they do have they build up these uh, social organizations where it, where it takes care of the people to a degree and they're satisfied to watch their TV but they're they're showing signs uh, I spent some time in Stockholm and, and traveled around there and uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, of uh, ferment in, in the Scandinavian countries we don't hear much about it or is the uh, ferment in the uh, youth uh, in, in by youth or by well, mo students? Mostly, or? mostly in youth. You won't find much ferment in in the o older groups because they're they're um, stuck down in some some kind of a situation. You two don't look stuck down to me. Well, we're the exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, see any hope in Euro-communism? I don't know what the word means. Do you, Scott? What is it? Euro-communism. Uh, uh, the Euro-communism. Euro yeah, that's uh, what the, the Spanish is. Europe has been trying since the Middle Ages to unite. And so far, it has failed dismally. Any effective unity in Europe seems to be highly, highly problematical. Let's break for lunch. Well, I just, I just got, I just got a, uh, a notice. Here. <laughs> Let, let's stop for a second. I'm yes, just two, it's two thirty. It's two thirty. <clears throat> Almost two thirty. Well, not on the last two thirty. I'm a little, a little faster than you are. <laughs> <laughs> See, I want you to update this. Let's start this off here.
Oh, political dynamite. That's what I call it going on here. <laughs> the only thing is, it's too bad it's limited just to the camera crew, practically. Yeah, but see, the, the whole, uh, you know, it seems to me that what this camera crew is about, it's not like NBC or CBS, as Scott was pointing out. This camera crew is, is aiming for bigger audiences. Right. Whereas CBS is a aiming yeah. for uh, a uh, highly elite, commercialized audience. Same. Yeah, CBS would say, but, but what are you thinking? You're freaking out. Uh, are you all right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess you would. Yeah. Okay. Um, my dear. I'm a born optimist. I'm here in the Maine woods, far from cities, to visit a couple who 50 years ago decided to give up on city life and move back to the land. They now live here in this house, a house they built themselves in almost complete self-sufficiency. They grow their own food, even in winter, using this sun-heated greenhouse. They heat the house and cook with wood they cut themselves. Scott and Helen Nearing's philosophy is hard work and self-reliance. They believe their lifestyle shows more respect for the earth. They call it living the good life. I like to live along and do the thing that I'm interested to do at the time uh, in the way that I'm interested to do it. Well, that's a part of the good life. We have this wonderful quietude and the freedom to do what we like. We grow what we consider 85% of our own food. It comes straight from the garden or from the cellar not from the supermarket. It's, uh, it's direct, it's fresher, and it's uh, more nourishing. And we know it's unpoisoned because we put no poisons on it. You grow almost all your own food. You build your own house rock by rock. You put every I, stone in this building. Yeah, I uh, insisted on it. We simply enjoy it. We see a stone and uh, we wonder where to put it. We're, we're gathering stones now for another building. I call this the 70-90 house because we built this in our 70s and 90s. And uh, maybe there'll be a, a century house, I don't know. Next year, Scott will be 100 years old. Helen will be 79. You'd think that homesteading would be a pretty hard life. Not hard at all, it's very easy. I was born in New York City and uh, I would consider it very hard to go back to New York and live the, the life of a New Yorker. <coughs> and as far as I'm concerned, one of the most interesting things that one does is cut wood. Two hours of this at a time is enough, probably, for an old person. It certainly won't send you to the hospital. Every year, thousands of people just drop in to visit the nearings. Why? We don't really quite know because what we're doing is so obvious and simple to ourselves, it's not worth writing about. We just live it. And you teach these people? Teaching is my job, mm. and I'm supposed to know something about it. And I do, as a matter of fact, because I, I have been paying attention all the time. And they learn from you, and... I hope, I hope they learn. <laughs> if they don't learn, it's their hard luck, or my hard luck for having tried to teach it, a difficult person. You feel it's all right if people don't want to follow your way of life, the way it's, I live in a city... Too, it's too bad, yeah. Too bad, too bad for us. It's too bad for you, yeah. I think in order to be self-subsistent on a farm, it's good to have a team, to have at least a couple. Be hard to homestead alone. I feel very lucky to have lived along with Scott because I think he's an exemplary, out of the ordinary chap. I feel very lucky at that. Do the thing that you believe in. Do the best you can in the place where you are and be kind. I'd like to get people into the habit 
of living physically and mentally and morally in such a way that when they get all through, the earth is a better place to live in than it is now. On this Earth Day, the first day of spring, Robin Young remembers the man considered to be the father of modern ecology, Scott Nearing. Robin visited the Nearing home in Harborside, Maine last fall, just before Nearing's 100th birthday. And she talked with the woman whose name has been connected with Nearing for 50 years of often controversial homesteading. I'm Helen And, but he's, he, he's it. He's Scott Nearing. And then Helen And goes before it. Helen and Scott, Scott and Helen. Inseparable since they first met when he was 49, she 26. Pete Seeger wrote this song about their back to basics lifestyle and it soon became a movement. We never imagined that it would become a sort of a model for people. I mean, we, we lived that way because that was the way we wanted to live and Pearl Buck came along and said, what you have here, you've got to write it up. They wrote many books that told about the making of a radical, the making of maple syrup, and the most popular, Living the Good Life. Then the disciples came to Scott. They have uh, lots of visitors, and everyone knows what those visitors are. It's true that a lot of the visitors were, like Scott Nearing, communists with a small C, committed to a system of sharing, but not a political party. And natives were both proud and a little wary of their celebrity neighbor. They are talking to an old native, stay the main and you wouldn't have to go back but a couple of generations you'd be way back and native stay the main don't care for communists because he worked why well, he built a stone wall i think he will 32,000 wheelbarrow loads of stone to build it he could mix the concrete in a wheelbarrow but i put the rocks in our home made of stone building in our 70s and 90s who else builds a stone house in their 70s and 90s the Nearings also grew all their own food, saying that living off the land was simpler than working hard to make money to buy things, but definitely not easier. And now we warn the young people, we say, look, it involves work, it involves dedication, it, it involves uh, sticking to it. What's the payoff? And the comradeship. Scott Nearing was up and working until just a few weeks before our visit, but Helen was fast losing this comrade. He's going. He's gradually going. Good. Good luck to him. Uh, there's a lovely quotation. You're in a ship, and the ship goes down over the horizon. You say, she's gone, he's gone. But on the other side, they say, she comes, he comes. When we left that day, Helen told us that she'd bought a new pickup truck and built a pine coffin for Scott's funeral. If the coffin was too long, she'd lower the gate and put a red flag on it. She wanted to make sure it was an affair that celebrated a good life. By all accounts, it was. They said, they said, you can't surpass Dinah in what you're wearing. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, that was probably their real reason to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but as far as we're concerned, we, we yeah. always try to stay away from red things. Okay, um, this is Nearing, can you tell us where... Helen, make it Helen. Helen, can you tell us where you and your husband Scott did your research for the maple sugaring book? In the Fifth Avenue New York Library, he was writing a book on war and I would help him and get the re do the research and things for him, and then he would read certain chapters, and I'd have free time while he was gathering his material from the books I got. So I went to the rare book rooms in the New York Public Library and looked up from scratch on anything to do with sugaring, and there wasn't anything as such. There was nothing cataloged. There, was, uh, there were no books on sugaring. So I went through Dutch and German and Swedish and English and French books, and uh, looked in the indexes and flipped through the books, all these wonderful old ancient books, and there I found my material. And after days of this, I showed it to Scott, and he said, you've got stuff for a book there. Well, with our experience and our mistakes and our successes and the historic part that I looked up, 
it was a book, so then we started to write it together. And I took one chapter and worked at it, and he would take another chapter, and then I'd hand my chapter to him. And finally, in the end, we didn't know who had written which, although all the erudite parts were his and the simplistic parts were mine, but still, it was a mixed, it was a mixed book. We wrote it that way together. That's a marvelous story. <laughs> I, I, and the <laughs> Can you read all of those languages? Or? Yes, yeah, and I read very fast. And uh, Scott said I was a snob as to dates. If something had been quoted in 1736, I preferred it to something in 1829. I, I liked the, the older, the more original quotations, the better. And uh, from many of the books I read, it was not known whether the French taught the Indians or the Indians taught the French how to make maple sugar. And from the historic records, I could find that the Indians taught the French. Could you talk about that a little more? That's a really big point, and I'm with you. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. but I'd, I'd Well, even the, even the word um, uh, sucre, the, the uh, Indians had their word for it. Now, I haven't read my own book in a long while, so I forget what the Indian word was for it. But uh, they had a different word for white sugar, su sugar, they called it, uh, and their own sugar, which the French had never seen before from the trees. They had their Indian name for, for that, mm -hmm. which was a, a proof that they had taught the Indians. They had taught the French, not the French, the Indians. You had um, you had one reference to was it Sebastian Rassels or, or something like that who had come to the mouth of a river and, and found the Indians sugaring yeah. there. Yeah, and they did it very primitively. They just gashed the trees. They must have lost an awful lot of sap. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, spouts were a much later uh, apparition. Um, Perhaps you answered this when you were telling the story, but how long were you in the process of writing the book? Did, did it take quite a while? I should say a whole winter's work. We were living in New York City at that time. We had the place in Vermont. We had the place in Jamaica. But uh, we had just gotten the sugar bush. I think we had barely started to sugar, but my interest was aroused in sugar. Therefore, I went off on my own and, and did this research with no thought of anything but my own interest and occupying my time while Scott was doing something else. I should say a good long winter's work went into the uh, research. And I still, if I find old quotations on sugaring, I still collect them. Would, would you share some of those with us? I mean, this is aside from the video, but mm -hmm, if, if you mm -hmm. find something yes, of interest. Yes. Don and I have been collecting sugaring phrases, um, things that we think are in our language that come from sugaring, and one of them is nitty gritty. We wonder if, huh. if the nitty gritty is when you get down to the niter, which is gritty, you know, you're down to the nitty gritty. There's not much. Well, well, well. Hey, that interests me. Could you go into the kitchen, into the p pantry, and on your left side, reach far in on your left side in the first shelf, <laughs> and you'll find a little syrup bottle this big. Okay. A glass, a glass old lady okay. in the kitchen. You'll find it. This is a bottle of syrup that I put up 35 years ago. I must have boiled it one of the last days I was there. It's absolutely fancy. It has no, no uh, sand on the bottom. It has not crystalled. It is just done, done completely perfectly. It's sealed only with a cork and a little sealing wax. And there that bottle is. I'm glad to be able to uh, show it to the Vermont sugar bakers because it's a, it's a prized copy of uh, very fancy syrup. Most of our syrup was fancy because we worked at it so assiduously. We were out early gathering. The sap never stayed in the buckets. It was all, Scott worked out a system of seven miles of three quarter inch galvanized pipe went up into the sugar bush. We were, we were like in an amphitheater so everything could come down. And it came down in pipe and within five minutes after they poured it in up above, I was boiling it down below. So it didn't stand around any. And so we got lots of very fine, fancy syrup. How many years ago was this, Helen? Oh, God. Uh, we left 
Vermont in about 52, 53. So we that's went. quite a while ago. Why did you leave Vermont? Let's talk about that. We one. left Vermont because it became non-Vermontish. It turned into a vacation place for, it started to turn into a vacation place. We smelled it coming. And we had wanted to live in isolation and in the wilderness and the woods, and we didn't want to live with uh, station wagons and beer drinking, wine drinking, city people. So uh, we left and we found another isolated spot up here. And now civilization has followed us up here and they're putting up two hundred and four hundred thousand dollar summer homes nearby. Where do you go from here? What does that do to a community, do you think, when you get Dis those 200? Disrupts it terribly, uh, but there's nothing you can do about it. The 400 acres that has been taken over by a real estate development, just, you see that lovely point over there? It's starting there and going around the uh, point. Um, before that, they were going to put a nuclear plant there. We had not been here two years, and uh, a lien was put on the land on the 400 acres for a nuclear plant. We thought we'd jump from the frying pan into the fire, but uh, they found a fault, and that it doesn't stop them in California, but it stopped them here. And so the land was then open and free, and uh, a bid was made for it by real estate developers, and it's now going on. What's happened to the land in the area where you were in Vermont? What turned into Stratton's the biggest ski area in the east with swimming pools and tennis courts and golf links and ski, ski runs everywhere. Um, can you tell us about any interesting experiences that you had, maybe in connection with the writing of the book? or? a long time ago. Well, we, d we did a lot of, um, of gathering in very deep snow, no, in tapping in very deep snow, so that by the time the snow went down at the end of sugaring, we had to reach way, way up high for the buckets. I remember that particularly. And it was hard gathering on snow because your snowshoes collect heavy, dense, wet snow, packed snow. She's having difficulty finding that bottle, so I could just go right there. We can stop. It's cranked up here. Yeah. And then you'll want to put this in place again. No, well, he, has it, he has right. it in, no. She's in place. Well. You know, if you hold it up a little to the side of you, I think we're going to see the color. No, no, it's better against yeah. your shirt. Yep. If you hold it in front of you, the light comes right through it. Okay, Helen, can you tell us about that syrup that you have? It's really, apparently, fancy syrup. And I must have taken it off at exactly the right temperature and exactly the right time. It's not too thick, it's not too thin, and it was just a casual, I thought I'll save one of those bottles. So this is just one I picked up. It has no sugar, sugar at the bottom. It's not moldy. And there she is corked with a little bit of sealing wax after 35, 40 years. Sweet old lady. And at the time we made syrup, we got $3.39 a gallon. And now it's 33, I guess. And this little old lady we sold for about, well, maybe a dollar seventy-five. And now this sweet little old lady would probably go for 15, I don't know. I wouldn't sell her for anything. That's great. Um, $49 a gallon, Helen. What? $49 a gallon is highest, but Gee. the lowest. Well, of course, we, we used to use it. We had so much syrup. We made uh, six, seven, eight hundred gallons a year. And the last year I boiled, I took off a little over a thousand gallons the last season. Scott and three fellows were gathering in the bush and I boiled down below. And we got three dollars a gallon for our syrup. And fellows worked for us three dollars a day, which was the going wage then, and they could take either a gallon of syrup or had the cash. 
and, and one fellow took this, he wanted the syrup very much, and he went off with a gallon, a Coca-Cola, a gallon bottle of syrup in glass, and he cracked it against the wall, and there was his days. <laughs> I hope I gave him another gallon. Everybody that came to the sugar house at that time, I'd save little bottles and give every child, give everybody who came some syrup. And anybody in the valley who did not make syrup got a gallon of syrup for us, from us during the season. It was, it was fun. It was the hardest work that Scott and I had ever done and the most enjoyable. It took that wonderful month of March that's usually so muddy and slithery and slimy and unpleasant weather and really uh, enhanced it. We enjoyed March and April. We tried sugaring uh, one year in February. It was a little early. The sap was not as sweet. It, apparently it has to stay in the trees longer. It certainly wasn't as sweet. We even tapped a few trees in December to see what would happen e on a warm day. The sap was not good. You couldn't make uh, sugar of it. We took uh, almost half of our syrup and turned it into maple sugar. We made um, gold bricks. I had a little weighing machine with a weight on it and a pan here, and I would pour the, the sugar the soft sugar into the pan, and just at the point it hit a pound, I'd take it off. So we had pound gold bricks, which I wrapped in cellophane and sold at the place. That was hard sugar. That, would that be was hard sugar. And we did something which no one has ever done before or after, so far as I know. We made maple sugar lollipops, and I would take a, a stick and put it in our rubber forms, with a Santa Claus or a man or a woman or a leaf or a heart. And the, as the sugar got hard, it would make a wonderful lollipop. And the harder the sugar got, the better the lollipop. Did you mm -hmm. okay, our bush, our, bush uh, our maple sugar bush, we bought for about, well, I don't know, $25 an acre. And now I think it's going for eight to $10,000 an acre. And it's being all cut up for little condominium homes. Can you tell us about the um, the soft maple sugar again because his battery was running out and so we didn't get that. Did you make soft sugar? And yes, we would make soft and hard sugar and the soft sugar, of course, Scott did the cooking. I did the pouring and the getting of the forms ready. I had little rubber forms and I had cans and bottles and things. I did that part of it and he worked at the stove and when it was just the right consistency he would on the stove, he would take it off and beat it to just the right consistency. And then we would pour it in a funnel and I'd put it in pans if it was soft or into molds if it was to be hard sugar. And then I would pack those in uh, little paper cups and make, make little uh, scenes. I think I wrote about it in the sugar book. I would put uh, little clover shapes in green, and then I'd have little trees in green, and then I'd have blue stars, and call it Starry Night, or Three Pigs Out Late, or something or other like this, or Little Man in the Woods. And I would take them, and once a week, I would go on a selling round from, from Jamaica to Manchester, down to the Molly Stark Trail, and then back again over Brattleboro. And Scott would come sometimes and help me carry the uh, heavier loads, and the men at the stands would say, bring that in and bring that in, and they thought he was the hired man, and someone would come in and say, Dr. Nearing, so interesting, I, I haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> they didn't know, he had no lugs, he didn't care, he carried the, he did the hard work for me. And we cut all our wood. We boiled entirely, of course, with wood. We got all the wood by cleaning up the sugar bush. Mm -hmm. And I would heave in these big three to four foot logs into the evaporator. We had a five to 16 evaporator. It was a big one. I guess so. Okay. Yeah. Scott and I were just as interested in um, literary things as we were in gardening and in wood cutting and in sugaring. And we happened to uh, send a penny postcard and to the Encyclopedia Britannica Company and ask what the price of a new encyclopedia was. We had an old 11th edition, I think, and we wanted a 13th edition. And we just wanted to know how much it cost. 
That was all we asked. And while I was boiling one day, two salesmen in long black overcoats and, and black hats on, real city men, came to sell us an encyclopedia. And I said, look, first I'm boiling, I'm busy. Scott's up in the, in the woods. He was the one who was interested. And uh, you'll have to wait till he comes down. And I don't think we intended to buy one. We just wanted to know what the price of one was. And they said, well, we'll wait till he comes down. So they sat and watched me for a while, hurling the logs in and taking the syrup off. Finally, they said, we've always wanted to uh, fire in, an, in a train engine. Can we, can we fire for you here? I said, sure. And I showed them where the logs were, and they kept the fire going. And then the fellows were coming down from the bush they'd been gathering. I thought it would be funny for them to see these two salesmen in the bush, so I said, gave them two buckets each and said, go on and gather from the trees round about the sugar house. So there they were, gathering sap around the sugar house, and the, the fellows came down from the bush and gathering. Now that was a good, good sight for them. They sold Scott the encyclopedia. He bought it. I'm, I'm surprised that they didn't give you the encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the experience. Mm. Oh, they were just salesmen. Well, mm. I've forgotten the other question that when we, we moved. Oh, I think this is a good one. Um, what is it that you and and you suspect Scott to especially like about maple? What what's important? What do we like about maple? Yeah, maple. Just maple sugar, maple syrup. Uh, not product. Oh well. Well, in in a sense, we liked it so much that it almost it was one of the six or seven reasons why we left Vermont. One was that the ski industry came too much around us, and it became too stylish and too expensive to live there, and the taxes went up so high. But one of the reasons was we were dispensing too much sugar and too much syrup, and we didn't know how good it was for the health of the people who got it. For instance, uh, we used about 10 gallons of syrup a year in the household. I'd use it to make applesauce, I'd use it for cooking, I'd put it over pancakes, I'd use it for everything. And I'd give a lot away, so that was 10 gallons of syrup for one family is rather a lot of syrup. So uh, we liked it too well. And then when I was making the maple sugar, you always pick up pieces and you're eating sugar. So now I'm up here, I use about a gallon a year. And uh, I'm lucky to get that at the price it now is. I oh. ought to have kept more little bottles like this. How about uh, the maple season when it comes on at the end of winter and so forth? How yeah, that, that is a, a real joy. We were, we were about the first in the valley always to get out and uh, tap the trees. We'd experiment a little. And uh, as we were just working in it ourselves with two local fellows, we could start whenever we wanted. And one uh, young man was so good at helping us with sugaring that in order to be sure we had him for sugaring, he worked all winter with Scott getting wood, cl clearing up the uh, sugar bush and uh, making it look practically like a park. We got all our wood that we needed by clearing the bush. Heaven knows how many cords we would use, about maybe 15, 16 cords a, a year to make that much syrup. Scott liked working in the woods, I think, as, as much as uh, sugaring. I, one of your references in the, in the Maple Sugar book was to um, Thomas Jefferson and um, how he was a proponent of sugaring. And I've been in correspondence with Monticello, and one of the trees he planted is still alive on top of um, So they the sugared hill. that far south? He tried. He tried desperately. Mm -hmm. He planted three groves of maples. He was sure he was going to be able to do it. And each time, most of them died until the last group, he, he did he manage. He succeeded, yeah. Mm -hmm. They've tried uh, sugaring in Sweden. They've tried sugaring in Germany. But mm -hmm. they don't have quite the right climate. We just have the sufficiently warm days and sufficiently cold nights so that uh, Vermont is surpasses in it and Canada. Yeah, I would like to sugar again. But there are no trees here. Maples don't grow by the ocean. They want the high hills and the rocky hills and cold nights. 
one days. Well, no I really questions. thank you. I'm sure no there are 15 questions, questions but we've taken so much, the way down. So much yeah, of your lucky. time. We, we yeah. just feel fortunate, and you've told us some wonderful yeah. stories, and it looked really good. Didn't you yeah. enjoy it, Dad? Oh, yeah. Isn't that it's great. And you'll take a... Um, I'm not attached here, am I? Nope. I'm, nope, I'm so used fine. to yanking these things. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> See her, Helen? It's a little up, yeah. bit, it's a little oh, bit washed nice. up because the light is hitting it. But oh yeah. Oh. <laughs>
for some, there, there are Thank you. 